Hey, welcome ladies and sinners to another Tuesday evening edition of the Sin City Sports Show presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. This is episode 60, a bit of a celebration tonight. Episode 60, it's a soft celebration because I got to give a quick plug and a shout out to the man, the myth, the legend, Taron Rodriguez himself for his 200th episode here on IE Sports Radio on Setpoint, uh, hosting Setpoint, um, IE Sports Radio volleyball expert. Uh, he's, he's done a kick-ass job. He's a great teammate. He helps uh, Larry B. with a lot of things around the station. He, he's just the man, the myth, the legend. I want to congratulate him on his 200th episode. Again, welcome to the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. I'm your host, Kale Henderson. You guys can get at us on our Twitter forums, at Sin City underscore IESR, at Kale underscore Henderson. On, that's my personal Twitter, where I talk more than just Vegas sports. On top of that, if you guys ever want to listen to the show, first off, give us a follow. Hit that follow button, all right? Smash likes, all right? Because we're always tweeting. We're always giving you guys love. Vegas love. Title Town, the new Title Town, right? But most importantly, you guys can catch us on multiple, multiple podcast stations, apps, Spreaker Podcast Player, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Amazon Music, Good Pods, CastBox, Deezer, Podcast Addict, and Podchaser, as well as Geo Savan. Again, the, the biggest ones would be the Spreaker, Apple, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Apple Music. You guys can catch replays of the show at, at any, any, any Tuesday evening. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Taryn chimes in. Good evening, Kale. Again, the, speaking of the, not the devil, but the man, the myth, the legend himself. It's like, it's like his nose or ears were itching, man. I don't know. I said tough loss for the Ramblers on Saturday to the Orange County Stunners. But they beat the Utah Stingers on Friday and clinched the American Coastal Division and are still contention for the number one seed in the American Conference. Thanks for the shout out, Kale. It means a lot. Happy uh, to support your show, brother. No, I mean... Dude, I don't do enough for you, man. I ain't gonna lie to you. Uh, hectic schedule's been so hectic. I was able to tune in for a little bit, but I couldn't really comment because I had I had one earbud in while I was listening to meetings at work. Um, dude, you do a kick-ass job. You do a kick-ass job there. Uh, to be honest with you, man, I don't know a lot about volleyball. Um, I'm like a dude's dude, um, and that, that's not saying anything about you. What I'm saying is your ability to take a sport that, if we're being honest, like doesn't hit the Richter scale as far as like exciting sports on a consistent basis. And it should, it's, it's very underrated. Volleyball is very underrated. Your ability to take that sport and make it interesting on a week to week basis and the amount of coverage and effort you put into it, man, very impressive. It's impressive. I hope I put that much effort, half that effort into, uh, you know, Raiders stuff th- this upcoming season and stuff. Cause you're awesome, man. Really? You deserve the shout out. Congratulations on your 200th episode, and we got to give a lot of love to Taryn because Taryn's an excellent teammate. With that, I mean, it's a great segue. I was going to go right into the Las Vegas Ramblers. Thank you so much for that update. Um, he's not wrong, man. Tough loss to the Stunners. Not a huge deal, though. Listen, I I personally believe, pardon me a second, I personally believe that uh, this is still one of the better teams in the NBA. Uh, they've, they've shown that they've stayed atop of the division or top of the conference. They're number one as we speak in the American conference. They're still in contention, as Terrence said, with a three point lead for the number one seed. Have the Ontario Matadors coming up in Las Vegas the 7th of July. Man, that's a good that's a good wait. Terrence, can you kind of shed some light as to why there's so much time in between matches sometimes? It's kind of crazy, man. Maybe it's because of the holiday season coming up and stuff like that, but I think that's pretty crazy. And then it feels like there's not another one for another month, right? Ramblers playing the Southern Exposure. And I have alerts set up for that, so I can make sure I keep track of that, Taryn. Thank you so much. But yeah, the Las Vegas Ramblers are killing it. The defending NVA champions, the National Volleyball Association champions, uh, have been rolling. They've been rolling lately. They've had a great year. Yes, they may have lost, but before that loss, they won five straight. The Ramblers play their matches at Long Beach City College. Oh, okay. Fair enough. So is it hard to book that venue or something? How, how does that work? 
you don't have to get in the details. Just It's just interesting. Or maybe that's just how the NVA schedule rolls. No big deal. I, I'm, I'm willing to learn, man. Learn more so I can provide better coverage. But speaking of that, you know, before that loss to the Stunners on the 23rd, so just a few nights ago, um, the Ramblers run a five-game win streak. Five-game win streak, kicking ass, taking names. Can't, can't be upset with that. Did an excellent job. Got to love it. Have an excellent season, man. And honestly, when you look at some of the games, they're just completely dominating. 3-0, 3-1, 3-0, 3-2. That was one of the closest ones in that five-game stretch against Team Freedom. And then he had a 3-0 victory versus the San Diego Wild. Absolutely. And Event 5 is going to be really intense. Playoff spots are on the line. Love it, man. So you folks, make sure you stay tuned here in Vegas to the Las Vegas Ramblers, the defending National Volleyball Association champions. Um, they will be taking on Ontario in about a week, to be honest with you. Shortly after that 4th of July break, we're going to see them take on Ontario. And, and as as Taryn said, big time big time aspirations for playoff spots because it'd be nice if they had the number one seed. I think they had the number one seed last year and it worked out well for them. Got to get the number one seed this year. Um, National Conference, the Stunners team that um, the Ramblers just beat or just lost to, I apologize, just lost to. They're atop of the National Conference, beating the Tennessee Tyrants. Boy, Tennessee has looked pretty solid as well. Very solid. Very, very solid. Ramblers got a, got a tough test this year if they want to defend. Big time. Big time. And with that said, we definitely need... Oh, and Taryn chimes in. Inland Empire Matadors. The NBA need to update the Matadors location on all social media, including Twitter. Agreed, man. You know, I, I'll say this, Taryn, and maybe you can shed some light on this. I looked at the Ramblers website, team website. It looks dated, man. Their Facebook page looks dated. It's almost like there isn't – it's almost like they need you, man. They need you. They need to pay you to, to keep up with their stuff because – I don't know. I feel like sometimes I'm digging for information on websites that I don't even know if I can trust. No BS. But we're still here to support them no matter what. With that as a segue to our sponsor, read our platform, IE Sports Radio. For the last nine years, IE Sports Radio has been bringing you amazing content ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and and other authorized media personnel to build tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities around the country. Make sure you follow us on I, at IE Sports Radio. On the IE Sports Radio website, IE Sports Radio Twitter, get at us, man. Get at us. Terrence says, I agree. Dude, it's just it's kind of sad. How do you expect your league to be successful if, if, if the defending champs aren't covered? You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy. You got to promote the success. I'm not saying anything bad about your sport, bro. I'm just like from a marketing perspective, what's going on? Seems like your sport's intense, man, and exciting. They need they need to push that big time. I feel like you put more effort than the league does, but that's just kind of that's that's you, Taryn. It speaks volumes about who you are as a cover someone who covers uh, the NBA. Adam Karnick chimes in. Good evening, Kale. What's up, Adam? Nice show. I chimed in for a little bit. Uh, while I was prepping for the Sin City Sports Show here. Uh, don't appreciate your slights towards my uh, my Ducks, right? Yes, this is a Vegas show, but I'm a Ducks fan at heart. I grew up a Ducks fan. Uh, Emilio Estevez, Flying V, don't don't get at me. Congratulations to the Ducks, by the way, for uh, hiring Ryan Getzloff as the player development director. I think that's a smart move. Captain Duck is Captain Duck, man. And when you, when you read those old articles from the Bruce Boudreaux days and, you know, I mean, the players couldn't say enough about how great Ryan Getzloff was. He was basically another coach on the ice. I think that's a great move for the Ducks, man, to bring back a legend like that. And you know what? It's Adam, I could totally see R Ryan Getzloff being you know, a GM in the future. 100% be a president of Hockey Ops in the future. He's got, he's got a mind better than Bob Murray, in my opinion. I think he's, just, he's a hockey savant. He does a great job. Um, 
So I, I'm really excited to see what he does in his new position over there as the director of player personnel, uh, player development. Apologies. And Taryn, I'm sure Taryn would love to see the Ducks win a few more games too. They're net, they're definitely not as good as the as the Golden Knights. I mean, <laughs> nobody was this year, especially after that nine to three whomping to uh, finish that Stanley Cup final. Florida, man, do they even have ice in Florida? It's almost like they never practiced. That's for sure. Lo, I knew my I knew my pick was going to be a, upset some Duck fans, but. Uh, Michkov could turn to turn out to be the best player in the class, not named Bedard. Yeah. And Ducks are in position to snag a really great player, but that's kind of what you get for being one of the worst NHL teams the last few years. When was their last winning season, Adam? And while you're doing that, we don't have to look very far for the last winning season for the uh, Las Vegas Golden Knights because they're <laughs> they're the defending Stanley Cup champions. <laughs> yes, I'd like to see the Ducks do better this year. No place to go but up for them, Taryn. That is the truth. 2016, yes. I think that was like that year, that last year they made the playoffs. They barely kind of squeaked in. Um, I want to say the year before that, they were just dominating, man. They were crazy. 2007, it might be right. It might be right. It's been a while, dude. It's been a while. I used They used to be the reason I, I bought NHL TV. They killed. They just killed my my uh, thunder there. Now now I I purchased the Vegas the Vegas Golden Knights one. I, I'm not a trader. I swear. I just cover this. I just cover this team. I just cover this team. And that's a great segue. We'll, we'll kind of skip to the Las Vegas Golden Knights then in, in that aspect. Um, they have a couple prospects according to uh, THW or the HockeyWriters.com. Riley Height center. Out of Prince George Cougars, number 18, they're expecting to be someone that could be a an excellent fit. Um, his down, he's got a lot of strengths, man. I think he's got a lot of speed. 17, 18 Ducks were 45, 25, and 13. Yeah, good team. They were a good team, but they barely squeaked in. I don't think it was. There was like a dude, Adam, like seriously talking about the Ducks. There was a good six-year period where they just dominated that that division and honestly they dominated the western conference they were they were great until they got to that final against those really really good blackhawks teams and i mean i'm telling you man like even the blackhawks were saying playing the ducks sucked they were just a big physical hockey team ryan getzloff Corey perry ryan kessler um yeah gibson and goal dude those are some really good teams bob murray just kind of sold that down the track didn't he oof back to the golden knights i mean Riley Hyde is, is at the top of, of uh, the HockeyWriters.com Golden Knights first round targets list. Um, guy's not huge. He's 5'11", 181. Uh, he doesn't really have great speed, but his puck handling is excellent. He's going to lack in size, but he's going to develop. I think that's great. Um, and, and the Knights are picking at 32, so you're going to get a really, really versatile forward. Right, a really versatile player that you can add to your back end. And honestly, let's be real here: majority of these draft picks for the Golden Knights, they're not even on the team anymore. They tend to draft these guys, they develop them, and then they trade them for guys that they really, they really think can help the team win. Now, that's part of the reason why the Golden Knights have been so successful in their first six years. They just do a great job of, of finding guys and using the pieces and assets they have in their organization to build the team and make it better. Adam and I talked about it a, a hundred times last year before the season started. How were they going to maneuver the cap? Like with all those injuries and all those veterans, how were they going to maneuver the cap? They did just fine. And now they're the Stanley Cup champs. And you could argue, not just because they won the title, they were the best all-around team in hockey. Yes, the Bruins were unbelievable. They had a record year, unbelievable year, by the way. Bruins, uh, sucks that they lost in the first round against a Florida team that, that forgot how to play uh, those last five games of the season. But I can tell you guys right now, Here's an amazing statistic for the Golden Knights that nobody talks about. Nobody. Except for us on this show. Right? The Golden Knights did not have a single player. And they are full. Jack Eichel, Mark Stone, I mean, William Carlson, uh, Brad Marchessault. I mean, they're full of excellent, like, top players. Right? Top quality players. That could start for any other team. Really. None of them had a 70-point season this year. Not a single one. But... The team averaged more than 4.3 goals a game, second to the to the NHL Bruins, to the Boston Bruins. 
What about that statistic? Not a single 70-point player on your roster, but yet your team still averages 4.3 goals a game. That tells you it was just great team hockey. And that's why I have no problem saying this could have this 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 team could be one of the more dominant teams we've ever seen in the NHL. Now, I, it, they'd have a hard time against them Lightning teams of recent, man. I'm telling you, man, them Lightning teams were unreal, right? Maybe some of them, uh, maybe some of them Penguins teams with Sid the Kid and and uh, the Flower at goalie. You know, I, I, Phil Kessel when he was in his prime. The Iron Man of Hockey, who just won another title, his third, with the Golden Knights this year. I don't know, but I think this Golden Knights team, from a team perspective, the way they played hockey, dude, is impressive. And maybe, Adam, maybe you'll agree with me, maybe you won't, I don't know. But I, it was some of the best team hockey I've ever seen. It was so much fun to watch. And even if they had a bad game, you knew the very next game they were coming back with a fury, and they ended up winning by like five goals. It was crazy. And that, that to finish the season winning 9-3, to three, man. I don't know if we've ever seen nine goals in a, in a Stanley Cup final. For one team, I should say. Nine goals in a Stanley Cup final ever. I'd have to look that up. Maybe you can shed some light on that too, Adam. Has a team, has a single team ever scored nine goals in a Stanley Cup final game? Because that was incredible. And yeah, one of them, you know, the hat trick for Mark Stone was basically with an empty netter and the game was over. But let's be real, man. It's still impressive. Nine goals is still impressive. Those are supposed to be the top two teams, and Florida got mollywhopped. Yes, they were missing their star player, um, but you know, you know, sometimes that's the way it is, man. Hockey's a brutal sport. Injuries happen. The rest of the team's got to pick it up. I just, for my money, man, this Vegas Golden Knights team it was one of the best teams we've seen in hockey history, and I have no problem saying that. And well, we should be able to say that because they're a Stanley Cup champ now. They're in history. Their names will go on the Stanley Cup. The Traveling Cup. Excited for that team, man. They're doing a great job. And they, they can repeat, man. They're still in their prime. you got a lot of guys that are still in their prime. They might be getting close to leaving their prime. But when you have a young guy like Jack Eichel and William and young guys like Jack Eichel, William Carlson, and Brad Marchessault that you know can still carry this team even if Mark Stone decides he wants to retire, you're in good shape. This is a really good hockey team. Riley. So we, we just got to say the safe pick was Riley Height, according to um, Eric... Krukshank, uh, this guy sounds like a, the cat. That guy has the name of the cat in Harry Potter, for God's sakes. Crookshanks. But the HockeyWriters.com, Eric Crookshanks, straight up comes out and says on June 26th, the safe pick is Riley Height, center, 18 years old, Prince George Cougars out of the WHL. Great puck handling, not doesn't have overwhelming speed, isn't a, a big, lengthy guy, is 5'11". 181, but man, he can he can distribute the puck, right? The wild card, according to Eric Crookshank, the wild card is Daniil Butt, left wing, 18, Kel uh, Kelowna Rockets, WHL. WHL is getting a lot of love, man. You know, I used to I used to be a manager for the USHL. Um, I can tell you guys right now, the WHL and the USHL do an amazing job of developing athletes, do an amazing job of developing young guys. And, and getting them ready for college hockey. And that's one of the nice things I really love about NHL hockey. Even if you get drafted, they'll still allow you to play for the college team for a couple of years because it's reps. I, I love that stuff. Um, but the thing that's impressive about Daniil Budd is his size, man. Six foot five, 203 pounds. Um, he's, he's got, I mean, he realistically, and I, I, watched, I watched some highlights on him, man. He's got some decent speed for his size. He looks awkward. He's going to have to grow into his body a little bit. But the kid's 18, man. Like, give him a few years. And he could be a tank. He could be He could be 215 in a few years. Hockey players, they get in incredible shape. Um, but they, they, it takes them a little bit longer to develop because, I mean, they do a lot of skating. It's a lot of cardio. Uh, I don't think there's a ton of weightlifting for hockey players uh, with the exception of deadlift, squat, and stuff like that. We'll see him fill out a bit more. Uh, but we'll see what kind of... Uh, um, I think he's faster. I think he's, I believe when you watch the highlights, I believe he's faster than Riley Height. I do. I think he's faster than Riley Height. Um, and he, he can get space. And he's he's got, he's just got a cannon for a shot, man. His slap shot's a cannon. He's got a great wrist shot too. The sneaky pick, Oscar Fisker-Mulgard, according to Eric Cruikshank, uh, center, 18. So it looks like 
I, I think the focus for the Golden Knights, and I think this is spot on, they need to replenish their forwards because there's a lot of guys in their prime. And because of some cap constraints for the years ahead, they're going to need younger guys to step up and, and develop their skill level, right? But again, we talked about cap constraints last year, and that didn't seem to be a problem. They figured it out. They figured it out. They did what the Golden Knights front office has done for the first six years of their existence. They figured it out. They, they found assets. They used assets. They got the best players they possibly could. And now they're Stanley Cup champions for the first time in their six-year existence. So got to love that. But those, you know, the, the thoughts on those guys are, I don't know if any of those are bad picks. I would love to see the size, the size of Danil Butt. But I'll be real with you, man. Why does that Riley Height kid just look like a Brad March assault? I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying, why does he have those skill set? He's not overly fast. But he's, he's got great puck skills. He's a good distributor. He could be a scorer, man. Brad March is a beast, though. That guy, just score. he can just find the net. It's crazy. I can't believe the Florida Panthers just willingly let him go in the expansion draft like that. Awesome. But yeah, those are my thoughts. I, I, I mean, I think that the, those three kids are a perfect spot. I think Eric um, Crookshank did an excellent job on the hockeywriters.com, his piece for the Golden Knights. I'll keep you guys updated. The draft is just around the corner, and if those are the top three prospects for the first round pick, why not? If those are, in his opinion, I'm not, a, I'm not bad, I'm not mad about it, right? As Stanley Cup celebrations are continuing to go on, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mad about that. Just let them continue to fill the team with with young talent and develop it. That's the big thing. Let them develop it. Las Vegas Lady Aces. Actually, we'll take a quick break here. I'm going to play some drops from my great teammates, Taron Rodriguez, Adam Karnick, uh, Larry B., and stuff like that. We're going to go to a quick break. When we get back, we're going to talk about the Lady Aces here on the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. What's happening, sports fans? Are you a fan of Southern California sports? Are you looking for a show hotter than a hot summer day in California? Then look no further than the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, where I talk about all things Southern California sports. That's right, all sports teams from Southern California. From the hard-hitting tackles of the NFL, to the killer crossovers and big three-pointers of the NBA and WNBA, to the grand slams of the MLB, to the bone-chilling goals of the NHL, and to the booming kicks of the MLS, the SoCal Supreme Sports Show has it all for you. Oh, and let us not forget about the college sports as well. So join me, Taryn Rodriguez, every week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Football fans, this is me, your boy Larry B, inviting you to join myself, Callum Reynolds, Mike Pat, and John Felipe for one of the most electrifying football shows you have ever heard. Three and out, right here at IE Sports Radio. Recap of the week before, a preview of what's to come, and of course, three hardcore head to head prime time face offs each week. You don't want to miss it. up 
everybody? This is Darren Rodriguez. Are you a fan of volleyball? Are you a fan of Thunder Spikes? Then I have the show for you. Set Point, where I cover NCAA men's and women's volleyball, high school boys and girls volleyball, beach volleyball, and even professional volleyball. Catch the action every week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Hockey fans, I'm Adam Kernick. And I'm Zach Puplis. Together, we are the newest version of Hockey Talk on IE Sports Radio, The Neutral Zone. Zone, 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 zone. We love hockey, but we also know it's not everyone's first sport. So we want to make this show as much for new fans as for the diehards. Whether you can name all the Swedes on the 08 Red Wings Stanley Cup team, or if you can't tell if Varlamov is a goalie or the latest trendy vodka, we're here to help. With facts, figures, and outrageous fans, we bring you all the hard-hitting hockey news you can handle, while still keeping it fun and on the rails. Well, mostly. So tune in every week as we go around the hockey world, from college to Canada, the minors and the majors, and everywhere in between. So bring your sellies. And your one-timers. Your wicked ristas. And be sure to protect your five-hole. Catch the Neutral Zone every week on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. We promise not to pick on the Arizona Coyotes every episode. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Chi town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks, Cubs, White Sox. We'll cover them all, plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi Town Weekly every week right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Back to the second half of the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'm your host, Kel Henderson. You guys can get at us on our Twitter forums, at Sin City, underscore IESR, at Kale underscore Henderson is my personal. Please, tap the follow, man. Slap that follow, dude. It costs you nothing. Like a few tweets. Read them. Engage with us. Helps the show. Helps the Twitter page helps the algorithm man puts us on on the map a little more more tls out there right 
on top of that, make sure you folks are are downloading the Apple Podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Breaker Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. I mean, we're everywhere now, man. There could be more to come. Could be more to come. But you guys can review every every episode. You don't have to miss one. And we're really excited about that. Vegas is killing it. Title Town, the new Title Town of 2023, is killing it. Um, I don't know if you folks had a chance, but there was a ton of highlights about the Vegas Golden Knights celebration. It was like a massive concert, and they said roughly 40 to 50 thousand people showed up. Are you kidding me? And it's funny because some some Dallas Stars fan who's an absolute dingleberry decided he was going to tweet, "Oh, Vegas doesn't deserve a title. They just don't get it." They're not they're not celebrating the way they should. Are you kidding me? Forty to fifty thousand people showed up to celebrate a Stanley Cup championship. Title town, baby. That Dallas Stars fan is an absolute idiot. Dingleberry. That guy is just straight up waving in the wind and he doesn't even know it. We love it, man. And we love it because we love those types of people. Their stink always lets us know where they're at. Straight up. Terrible take. Terrible take. If you guys get a chance, make sure you guys check out my Twitter. I definitely beefed on that guy a little bit. I ain't gonna lie to you guys. Golden Knights are the are the Stanley Cup champions. We have a lot of champions. If it wasn't the Ramblers, if it isn't the Las Vegas Golden Knights, we now have the defending champs, the Las Vegas Lady Aces, who are 13 and one in the Western Conference. They currently have a six-game lead over the LA Sparks. They're on a six-game win streak. What? Yet ESPN, I don't know. I don't think ESPN is still giving them enough love. Yes, they still have them number one in the power rankings. And Connecticut Sun is number two at 12-3, and three, which there could be another rematch between those two teams, by the way, this upcoming championship. Because I, I fully, fully expect the Las Vegas Lady Aces to visit that championship game this year. Um, they're on a roll. They're hard to beat. Scoring more than 92 points a game. Like, come on, man. I just I just don't see it. I don't see it any other way. You got Jackie Young leading the team with 19.9 points a game. Aja Wilson with 9.4 rebounds a game. Both both Aja Wilson and Jackie Young are, are uh, averaging 19.6 points per game or more. Kelsey Plumes at 17. She's had a bit of a bump there. Chelsea Gray. Hanging in behind there. Candace Parker still putting in work, man. And the rebounds is what is where it's at. Uh, she's right behind. She's right behind Aja Wilson with uh, 8.6 rebounds per game to Aja Wilson's 9.4. So that's a big deal. Um, helps a lot. Gives an extra possession. Steals. Candace Parker is leading in steals for the team at 1.5 per game, which is kind of crazy. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of possession changes for the Lady Aces. They just play sound fundamental basketball, man. They, they move the ball down the court. And they score points. They score a ton of points. I mean, they're outscoring. Let's see here. Last I saw, they were outscoring other teams. I think it was like 92.3 points per game versus 72.4. So almost 20 points a game. The Lady Aces are averaging more than the rest of the league. Or the, or their opponents so far. I mean, they've absolutely mollywopped Seattle. Um, they've mollywopped Los Angeles multiple times. Uh, Minnesota didn't stand a chance. Atlanta was probably one of their tougher games this year. Still wasn't very good. The Connecticut Sun beat them, but before that game, the Golden or the Lady Aces beat the Connecticut Sun 90 to 84. That's going to be a tough team. Chicago Sky has taken a bit of a dip, um, but they they still we you know Lady they were because the Chicago Sky I think where they were number one last year in, in the Eastern Conference. Um, Lady Aces handled them pretty well. Uh, Seattle's just having a rough year, man. I, maybe they just aren't a good matchup, but yeah. Phoenix, 99-79. Indiana, 101-88. to And then Indiana again at home, 88-80. They're on a six-game win streak. Uh, play New York Thursday evening in Las Vegas on Prime Video, the Michelob Ultra Arena. Oh, yeah. 9 p.m. So we're looking at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Right about the time this show starts every Tuesday, right, folks? 
Lady Aces are kicking ass, taking names. I fully expect them to repeat, man. Fully expect them to repeat. You know what I you know what I expect? You know what else I expect to repeat? I expect Major League Baseball, I expect the Oakland A's or the or the ownership of the A's to just kind of fall flat on their face. Something they've repeatedly done in their relocation efforts. I mean they've had they've had four potential host cities. It looks as though they won't get this done with Las Vegas. Uh, Rob Manfred should be kind of held to blame, even though Rob Manfred's done a really good job of clearing the way and paving the way for the uh, Oakland A's become the Las Vegas A's. It's pretty frustrating, man. Like he's waiving the relocation fees, which is hundreds of millions of dollars. And the A's still can't get this done. Like they're pleading for Vegas to basically pay the rest of the way like like Vegas did for the Raiders. And it's just We've talked about it in multiple shows. This is just not the same situation. Major League Baseball does not print money the same way NH or the uh, NFL does. Major League Baseball is not as much of an attraction as the NFL is. I mean, look at the draft. The draft gets more viewers than the World Series, dude. The draft has more people showing up to the draft, like watching round one through round seven. It, Five through seven, they get more people in attendance than, than a Major League Baseball game does. There's like 100,000 people that show up to watch the rounds five through seven. We're not even counting round one. You don't even, you don't even see like 6,000 people in a ballpark in most cases. It's just the business doesn't make sense, and I don't get what the owner's doing. I know Rob Manfred's doing what he can, but at the same time, the guy's got to step up and say, dude, you guys got to wrap up this Vegas deal or or we might just leave you in, in Oakland. I mean, we'll, we'll put it like this. I'm reading an L.A. article as we speak, L.A. Times article as we speak. Uh, the writer is Bill Shaken. I want to make sure he gets his, his props. We're citing him. Um, Rod Manfred said himself, the Oakland process is at an end in 2021. In 2022, it needs to happen now. It needs to be done. In December of 2022, we're past any reasonable timeline for the situation in Oakland to be resolved. Okay. In April, Fisher, Fisher and Caval said they would make a deal in Las Vegas. The deal was supposed to have been done by Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, or at least sometime. Here's the thing. The A's are asking for $500 million. Absolutely not. If you're the if you're Vegas, you don't give them five hundred million dollars. There's a small group of specialists who negotiate stadium deals from uh, on a coast to coast basis, right? Um, I can tell you guys right now, and, and I'll say this: I, I can almost read this verbatim, right? I'll read this verbatim from Bill Shaken's article. There's a small group of specialists who negotiate stadium deals on a coast to coast basis. I talked to one who has worked on MLB deals for years. He is not involved in the Las Vegas deal, but he is astounded at how Fisher and Caval, which is the owner and the president of the A's, have failed to, at the basic, give and take that accompanies any negotiations. So essentially, and, and we've been saying this for, for months now, it's about the money. A's are asking like they're so here's here's what it looks like. Here's what the A's would be getting from Las Vegas: three hundred eighty million dollars in taxpayer money toward the new stadium. Taxpayer money. Plus plus free land for the stadium donated by a private company. Plus no property taxes because the A's would donate the land to the public agency. Plus no rent because the agency would waive it. Plus revenue from naming rights. That's half a billion dollars worth of goodies right there. That's the 500 million that the, the Vegas that Vegas is basically willing to give and it's in value. Yes, it's not a true 500 million dollars cash. Like the Raiders got 750 million dollars cash. They're entirely different entities, man. And Major League Baseball just fails to see they they're just they're quickly becoming the fourth best sport in America. And it's sad because baseball used to be a pastime, it used to be fun. The pitch count, the timer, like so many rules are changing, but now there's this. You have a struggling franchise in Oakland who's basically imprisoned into a lease that the dumb ownership, You, it makes you wonder if Major League Baseball has to step in and remove Fisher and Cabal. 
Kind of like the NFL had to finally do with Dan Snyder and his sale of the Washington football team. I know, I know they're the commanders, but for some reason, we all know that situation, right? They lost their naming rights or it wasn't coined. So they're probably going back to the Washington football team. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's pretty cool. But Las Vegas is basically gifting in value $500 million and the A's just can't get it done. Like, let's go over those benefits one more time. And I, I want to be 100% clear. Okay, I'm going to give you the, 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 la, the, the last two paragraphs, which mean the most. When a public hearing last week revealed citizen anguish that a baseball stadium might be a higher funding priority than public schools, it should have been a no-brainer for Fisher and Caval to say this. We want to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. If we are fortunate enough to become part of this community, the A's will donate $1 million a year to public education in Las Vegas. That's great. Guess what? That doesn't, oh my gosh, here's the second paragraph, and this is what's unbelievable. Here is what the A's would be getting in a Las Vegas relocation, $380 million in taxpayer money towards a new stadium, plus free land for the stadium donated by private company, plus no property taxes because the A's would donate the land to a public agency, plus no rent because the agency would waive it. Plus revenue from the naming rights. That's a half a billion dollars worth of goodies. And they still can't get this deal done. Are you serious right now? The A's ownership and president are an absolute joke. And Manfred needs to step in and do something about this. Yes, Las Vegas isn't just giving them $500 million in cash, but they're giving them $500 million in value. It's more than I would give as a business person. I'm not a multi-million dollar business person. I'm not overly successful. I'm just being real with you guys. I see the value between Major League Baseball and NFL, and there's a disparaging gap. And I actually tend to agree with the public school people. Is a million dollars a year per for public education good enough? No. The A should have to donate like five. Five per year. That still doesn't make up for the 500 million, 500 million or half a billion dollars in goodies or valuation that they're getting. I personally think the Las Vegas A should have to pay that 380 million back over a certain time because taxpayers are about to get a really crappy franchise moving to their city run by terrible ownership and an idiot president like dude. I just don't get it. So the A's might still pull out this victory, right? They might still get to Vegas, but I don't know if they're going to be able to get a deal done at this point with their with their mindset, man. And Fisher's basically saying, I'm drawing the line at $1.1 billion in contribution to the stadium. Dude, you're the owner of a team. You're getting relocation waived. You're getting money from taxpayers. You're a billionaire. You can you can provide more. Than, it's an investment. They would make more than $1.1 billion in their first five years for sure in Las Vegas because of the tourism alone. Even if their team is horrible, and it will be. Like The, the A's are an absolute joke. And I, I don't know if the A's will be in Las Vegas because if they don't figure something out, their lease ends next year. They will be a homeless franchise in 2024 if they can't get this figured out. Fisher is basically, he's, he's got negotiation tactics here. He doesn't understand how bad his negotiation tactics really are. And he's probably going to lose this deal. And he's getting a ton of value, man, from, from Vegas. And Vegas shouldn't budge. I think they gave more than what they should. This is amazing. I just, no property taxes, no rent, because it would be waived, and revenue from the naming rights. That is unbelievable. I, I just don't know how you fumble, fumble that, man. Because this A's owner could easily find another investor to put another billion dollars up. They'd do it to, to have a sports team or, or a part of ownership in Vegas. No way, shape, or form would that not be, be the case for, for another rich billionaire with a pallet of money. Go to Mark Cuban. 
He probably owns the Rangers, though. I digress. The A's are a joke. I don't even know if they're going to make it to Vegas at this point. Next, and in transitioning to teams that are a joke, the, the Raiders right now. Okay, so let's talk about their offseason grade. First off, Raiders rumors. Raiders pretty hopeful. Josh Jacobs reports to camp amid contract negotiations. I don't think Josh Jacobs sets foot on a field until he gets his new contract. He's going to force the Raiders to trade him before he shows up to camp, and he should. This crap, but we've been saying this for, guys, we've been saying this for months. This this organization, the people in this organization running the team and building the team, they don't believe in paying running backs, man. Not big time money. Does Josh Jacobs deserve it after last year? Absolutely. The man made holes when there wasn't holes. The guy had had, I think he had over he had 2,000 yards total last year. 1,600 of them were rushing. 1,300 of them were after contact. The guy definitely earned his money. Will the Raiders pay him? Probably not. And then now you have a rift again. Remember we talked about this, like all of this nastiness towards Derek Carr from the fan base, which is so weird and indirect, they can't let the guy go. He was honest. He was asked, hey, you know, what, what's going on with, with the past nine years? He goes, I accept my, he basically said, I accept my responsibility, but let's be real. When you have that much turnover in nine years, it's going to happen. He had six different coaches in nine years, man. Dennis Allen, Sperano, Jack Del Rio, John Gruden. Uh, then it went to Rich Bisaccia, who probably should have taken over without this mess going on. Now Josh McDaniels, that's six guys. Six guys were named head coach in nine years. Yes, a couple of them were interim. I don't care. That doesn't matter. They're still different personalities coming in with different wavelengths and, and coaching players and establishing the rock, locker rooms in different auras and different in different capacities. If you know anything about coaching, you know that not every coach is the same. It's like impossible. So the reality is this. And we talked about it last week. The, the Raiders coaching staff had one of the lowest grades in satisfactory, according to an NFLPA survey in general, because they don't believe that their coaches listen to them. They don't believe their coaches really care about them. It's just a business thing. Same crap was happening in Denver when Josh McDaniels was coaching there, too. Right now, the biggest problem is Mark Davis. We've talked about it. Mark Davis has owned up to it in the offseason. I don't think Derek Carr is saying anything outlandish. When you have six different head coaches in nine years, of course you're going to lose games. That's ridiculous. When you have that much turnover, that much turmoil, it's ridiculous. The Gruden thing was nobody's fault but Gruden's, right? The Henry Ruggs thing was nobody's fault but Henry Ruggs. The Damon Arnett thing was nobody's fault but Damon Arnett, right? Those are three incidences, but dude, why does it always seem like it's the Raiders? There's something going on with this franchise, dude. Straight up. Straight up. So let's do an off-season grade, right? So I look back at PFF, uh, Pro Football Focus, did a bit of an outlook for the 2023 season, okay? In his, in their mind, the best move of the off-season was edge defender Tyree Wilson. I don't necessarily agree with that, but they believe he's going to be a contributor. They remind him a lot of a young Chandler Jones. He's got length. He's got speed. Um, he's strong. And yeah, that's great. And you know, honestly, this is probably... There's no way Tyree Wilson's as bad as, as uh, Clee Farrell was. Like, let's be real here. Tyree Wilson is going to be a rotational pass rusher in year one. He's not going to be asked to start. You have Max Crosby and Chandler Jones there. Tyree Wilson's going to be put in a much better position to succeed because, you know, Clee Farrell was kind of just thrown to the wolves, if we're being honest. But the reality is Tyree is a much more talented pass rusher. He's a much more refined pass rusher. And he's still got a ton of room to grow, right? He's going to be situational. He might play... I don't know. Let's say there's 50 defensive snaps. The ideal situation is he plays 20 of them as a third pass rusher or gives Chandler break. Regardless, I don't disagree with PFF. I just don't know. Like, here's the thing. The first and second round picks this year, I think were hits. We haven't seen him play yet, but I love him. I, I love the idea of Tyree. I, I like Terry Wilson coming in as a third edge rusher. I think he could come in in year two, year three, and be a starter and, and be really productive, right? The Ravens did it for years. They do it for years. They 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 draft traits and they coach them up. Hopefully this, this coaching staff can do it. I don't know if I have faith in that, right? We'll see what happens. 
But I, I like it. And then Michael Mayer was an absolute steal in round two, man. The guy was a round one tight end. If it wasn't for his speed, and if it wasn't for the fact that his film showed nothing but double teams the last three years at New at, and uh, pardon me for, for the Fighting Irish, the dude was double teamed all the time. He was the only player, and the dude still caught a crap load of balls. He won't have to run into that with Devonte Adams out there. He won't have to run into that with Jacoby Myers out there. No, Michael Mayer is going to be open in this league, especially with the type of run game. Even with Josh Jacobs not here, I still believe that this run game is going to be powerful. I, I think Zamir White will step in. He's not going to be as polished by any means. I'm not saying it's the same result, but I do think Zamir White is a talented player. And we'll see some nasty things from him too. So the best two moves, according to PFF, were Michael Mayer, basically, and Tyree Wilson. Outlook for 2023. The Raiders do have a deep and diverse group of offensive players. And if the pass rush talent plays up to their capabilities, this team is capable of stealing more games than you would think. That's positive. I'm not against that. I get where that's coming from. The issue is the rest of the defense is hot garbage. You have Nate Hops. You have a struggling young safety in, uh, gosh, now I'm all of a sudden I'm blanking. I'm very sorry about that. He was drafted at TCU a couple years ago. Uh, someone that the Raiders traded up for to get. Some of it has to do with he's in his second defense in three years, right? He had his, he was learning his second defense last year in two years. This is his second year with this defense under Patrick Graham. So I, I totally, Trayvon Morig, apologies. I totally expect Trayvon to get better. Do I think he's going to be a massively productive guy in year, in year three? Maybe not. We don't know, dude. This defense is all over the place. Okay? And, and the other thing is that we still have massive questions about Jimmy G. Massive questions. Why is nobody talking about that? It's not talked about enough. The guy is still dealing with injuries. Will he be ready week one? Yes. Has he played a full season in a few years? No. Not at all. He hasn't played a full season at all. Will we see that? I don't, I don't know, man. Um, I like the Jacoby Meyer signing, right? I'm a fan. I, I, I like, I don't know. I, Austin Hooper could be interesting, but the rest of them, Jerry Tillery, he'll be good. Marcus Epps, eh, David Long, I don't know. Duke Shelley, like who are these guys, man? And you lose, you lose Matt Collins, who actually played pretty well last year, Foster Moreau, Denzel Perryman, and Rocky Sin. Rocky Sin made it to Baltimore, man. Good for him. He's gonna thrive there. Regardless, I'm looking at this this off season, man. I give it a C. I I think it was solid, C plus maybe. I think it was solid. I think the draft was a C plus. I think I think the uh, overall free agency, considering the cap constraints, was a C plus. We'll see what happens, man. But the reality is this: Josh McDaniels has to pull his head out of his ass, and he's really got to show that he's he's worth his salt. The problem is, guys, I don't know if he's on a short leash or not. If he goes eight and nine, he probably keeps his job because it's a one game improvement, right? If he goes nine and eight, we know for sure he's keeping his job. But he's in like the toughest division in football, dude. If, if people think that the Kansas City Chiefs got worse, they're crazy, right? They had a bunch of they had a bunch of rookies step up and play a lot of ball last year, and they're only going to get better. Um, they had an excellent draft this year as well. Uh, the Chargers, they're good, very good, talented quarterback, one of the better, more talented quarterbacks in this league, and he could really thrive under new offensive coordinator Kellen Moore. Who loves the vertical pass game? What is what is uh, Justin Herbert do very well? Stretch the field, right? Get on the move. I think that they need to get him on the rollouts, just like they used to do with Dak. If they do that, man, you're unleashing a different part of the offense you didn't have last year under that offensive coordinator. I, I don't know, man. And then the Broncos—they're going to get better. I don't—I don't think people realize Sean Payton knows what he's doing. He's a Hall of Fame coach. He's a Hall of Fame call play, play caller. Um, he's a Super Bowl champ. Sean Payton knows what he wants. They're going to play big physical bully ball in Denver. They're not going to be slouches. It won't be easy. 
It's that simple. So I don't think this division is just easy pickings. And, and right now, I think the Raiders are playing for third. I hope they steal a couple games, but the reality is, dude, this is a tough schedule. Tough division. So my offseason outlook right now, it's a C+. Plus. I'll stay a solid C+. Plus. And I'm hoping for optimism. I've already purchased Sunday ticket. I can't wait to watch. You guys know what it is. It's the Sin City Sports Show presented by IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. I'm your host, Kale Henderson. Get at us on our Twitter forums, at Sin City underscore IESR, at Kale underscore Henderson. You guys can listen to this show or listen to the catch up on this show on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker Podcasts. I mean, we're all over the place now. Catch up. Tune in next Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And as always, folks, thank you so much for tuning in and love, peace, and hair grease, homies.